Good afternoon. Uh, my talk today comes out of my dissertation, and I know you're thinking that's going to be real thrilling. Um, this might be a little more academic than you're used to here. Story, and I will do my best to make it accessible and interesting. Two aspects of these energy transitions, uh, the role of efficiency and the role of externalities, such as pollution, were of particular interest to my host here at SolarFest. And so I'll try to tell you a few things on those topics that maybe you didn't know before. In my work, there's a bit of history, a bit of math, and a bit of looking towards the future. First of all, what is an energy transition? It is a set of significant changes in patterns of energy consumption. The changes may occur in the inputs, like the resources we use, such as going from fossil fuels to renewables. The changes may also occur in the conversion technologies, such as the shift from incandescence to LEDs for lighting, or perhaps from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. Often occurring alongside these are major transformations in the end-use energy services that we get, which are things like heating and cooling and lighting and transportation. When you have changes in especially the second, the technologies, that leads to transformations the way society uses the end-use services. Why do we care? Well, first of all, we are already in a transition. It has been happening for a number of reasons, but the most pressing reasons are externalities. And these are also the reason we have to accelerate it. One set of externalities is the pollution associated with climate change. And another is other pollutants such as sulfur dioxide, mercury, and you know, many of the, uh, the byproducts of coal combustion. We most often think of these shifts in terms of shares, that is the fraction of energy provided by one resource or another. In the colonial period in the early US, our main energy resource was wood. We burned a lot of wood, uh, even compared to countries like Sweden, in part because we were clearing lots of new wooded land for agriculture. So our energy consumption per capita was like 100 gigajoules um, of mostly wood. We harnessed wind for sailing ships, and I quantified that in my research. We harnessed water for grist mills and for early factories. I quantified that too. We used other forms of biomass besides wood. We used whale oil, tallow candles, alcohol-based fuels for lamps. These were all pretty small in energy terms, but quite large in dollar terms. We cut ice from lakes in winter to provide cooling in the summer. Uh, and we even shipped it to tropical climates to cool drinks. So we put ice from the winter, packed in the sawdust, and sent it around to India or the Caribbean so someone could have an ice cube and a drink on sailing ships. In terms of energy content, though, wood was dominant. Now, the colonists mostly came from England. They knew about coal. Coal was well established as the main energy resource in England. So it's not, and they knew they had it here. So they knew about it, they knew it existed, and they chose not to burn it and rely on wood instead uh, because it was so abundant here. This is important that it points out that it's not like coal was better than wood. It simply had uh, abundance in England, but it wasn't intrinsically better for really any qualities of performance. Um, in the early US, we used wood for home heating, for smelting iron, uh, for fueling the early railroads and steamboats. Now the railroads um, drove the ascendancy of coal in three ways. First of all, they provided a cheap way to move the coal to market. By owning the coal fields and routing the lines near them, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad reduced its cost of coal by a factor of 10 between 1840 and 1862. Second of all, the locomotives themselves had a large appetite for coal. And third, the improvements in steam engines coming out of the railroad industry led to broader use of steam engines for factories. Uh, spillover benefits, you might say. A growing market provides the most fertile soil for transition, uh, and that was the case here. The railroads made coal cheaper, and they increased demand for it, both directly and indirectly. By about 1885, coal had overtaken wood. Petroleum was discovered in Pennsylvania in 1859. A range of lamp oils had been used previously, including whale oil, lard oil, alcohol-based fuels, 
and some oil distilled from coal. Kerosene from petroleum was much less expensive and much more abundant, so it very quickly gained market share in that niche. But a few observations. First of all, petroleum didn't save the whales. People thought it would at the time. There were editorial cartoons and newspapers of the whales rejoicing the oil had been discovered. Uh, you might have read a book called Freakonomics, so they repeat that claim. But mechanized whaling fleets powered by petroleum killed far more whales in the 20th century than had been killed in the 19th. We had oil, but that didn't stop whaling. It was the environmental movement that saved the whales. So that's important to remember. Another observation about oil is that oil lamps were kind of a second best form of lighting. Cities preferred gas lighting. The gas was usually derived from coal. Um, and that was always a larger market economically. I thumbed through all the census reports for the market size and, and found it. And the gas lighting was always a bigger market. So while kerosene for lamps was the market for oil, it remained a pretty small fraction of our energy supply for the first 50 years of its existence. It kind of crept along, you know, 1900, still a very small fraction of our energy was coming from oil. You know, almost 50 years, in 1909, 50 years later, after it was discovered, still not much uh, oil was being used. And that's because technologies and not fuels are what drive these transitions. An oil lamp could have gone from being fueled by lard oil to coal oil to petroleum, but it was still fundamentally an oil lamp. It was cheaper to operate, but it really wasn't any better or brighter or safer or more convenient. Um, on the other hand, just going from coal, a coal oil lamp, to a coal gas light, to a coal electric light bulb, offered you huge improvements in efficiency, performance, controllability, safety. Uh, so even though you're still, you were still using coal in that case, going all the way to Edison's light bulbs, you really changed your quality of service. You could use light bulbs in factories and mills and theaters where the flammability of gas lights was a, a real vulnerability. So a new fuel did not provide the transformation of lighting. A new technology did. And a lot of people you know, defending the use of fossil fuels talk about the fuels as these miraculous things. They have some advantages in certain uh, cases, but the technology is what really mattered for these uh, industrial revolution uh, transitions. So taking these factors together, we see why petroleum didn't really take off uh, until it had its killer app. It was just a new fuel and an old technology until you had the internal combustion engine and automobiles. And that's when petroleum really took off. So in a lot of these cases, you have to find out what is the, the killer app. Gas pretty much grew along with oil. They were generally produced together. Gas had many different uses. The most important, for my purposes, was it took over from coal and home heating in around the 1940s, in part due to the fact that it was cleaner. So cleanliness was a valued attribute in this shift from gas to coal, uh, from coal to gas, rather, for home heating uh, in like the 1940s and 50s and 60s. From about, uh, here we have nuclear appears on the scene. And then from about 1975 to 2005, we have this stagnation. this almost flattening where there's not a whole lot of change. That's basically a flat line. That's pretty flat. These are pretty flat from about 75 to 2005. Nuclear really comes you know, from about there to there. Grows a bit, but not much. So people are wondering, what's happened? Why didn't nuclear take off? There were forecasts in the 70s and 60s about how huge it would be. How huge nuclear was going to transform everything. Too cheap to meter, right? You know that one. Lots of other things. Well, what happened in the 70s? We had these oil shocks. And that has something to do with why nuclear didn't take off. Even though nuclear is electricity, I think oil is transportation, they actually were tied. Um, energy per capita fell quite a bit. Uh, since 2005, you can see our energy per capita is down by about 37 gigajoules. Um, which is roughly 10%. Oil is down, coal is down, gas and renewables are up, but not by as much as the other ones went down. So we use a lot less energy per capita than we used to. You can see it dropped off a lot in the oil shocks here, and then it dropped off a lot again after about 2005. So why didn't nuclear take off? It was due to conservation and efficiency. 
When we had the oil crises, remember that some electricity was produced by oil. So not only did we put in fuel economy standards for cars, we put in efficiency standards for appliances. And with that greater focus on efficiency, there was less need for electricity. Electricity had been growing like crazy, 10% a year in the 50s and 8% a year in the 60s. And that growth was slowing and slowing with these oil crises. Another thing that nuclear had as a problem is that it didn't do anything uniquely valuable. It didn't have a killer app. It was just another way to boil water for power plants. And people at the time, some people at the time said this. They said, well, yeah, it's another way to make electricity, but what can it do uniquely? It can run nuclear submarines. That's not much of, much of a niche. It didn't really do anything better um, in the way of boiling water, which is really all it had to do. So you had the fact that it had no killer app aside from the subs, and it had this declining growth in electricity sales, really falling off quite a bit in the, uh, the 80s. Um, so a lot of the utilities that had ordered nuclear plants canceled them. An invisible resource, energy efficiency, took over where nuclear had been expected to take over. You can't see efficiency on this chart of, uh, of different shares. Efficiency doesn't even show up. It's only the invisible reason for this decline here. So efficiency took over. They canceled a lot of orders for nuclear plants. Had grassroots opposition as well. But conservation and efficiency made those plants redundant and unnecessary. And so they were canceled. <coughs> you can kind of see the effect of efficiency here. This is energy per capita. Um, here's the 70s. It's kind of flat or declining since about 1970. And this is all energy. This one is uh, electricity, and then this is all energy, including transportation, home heating, and things like that. So we had efficiency standards. Um, sorry, this is just commercial energy. When you factor in the traditional firewood, that's your overall picture there. So you can see we use about three times the energy per capita that we used in the 1800s, which it's a lot, but um, we could probably get you know, back closer level. We used quite a lot in the 1800s. By now, we're back down to about 1968 levels due to these efficiency improvements that we've had uh, since the oil crises. Price does play a role. Uh, even with the recent drops in oil prices, it's still expensive compared to uh, the 1960s period or even the, the late 80s, early 90s period. Culture plays a role. We now look at waste and energy as a bad thing. That wasn't always the case. You might also see another term related to efficiency, and that is energy intensity, or energy per dollar of GDP. Now, I know GDP is not a perfect metric. I'm sure many of you know the Bobby Kennedy quote. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. He was correct that GDP does not directly measure the health of our children or the quality of their education. But at the same time, you can see that there are some correlations. This is a graph of GDP and life expectancy at birth. The same pattern holds true for other metrics, like the Human Development Index or the Social Progress Index. It does have diminishing returns. But even so, it's a metric that we use in this field. It's a tool for measuring the amount of goods and services that we produce. So what you can see is that we've been getting better at attaining more of everything from a given amount of energy. Substantially better. This is a result of improving efficiency. We use about triple the energy per capita of the 1820s USA, but we generate about 30 times the goods and services. So our energy intensity is about one-tenth of what it was. Part of this is due to our vastly more efficient ways of heating our homes. 1820s America was pretty wasteful with firewood. They used open hearths. The Franklin stove had been invented, but wasn't really adopted until the middle of that century. Now, there are periods of time when we see very little improvement. Here, from about 1900 to 1920, energy intensity actually seems to have gotten worse. We were using 
more energy for the same amount of economic output. This was a period of steam-driven engines using pulleys and belts with increasing losses as the factories grew bigger. And it was a real problem for industry. Electrification turned that around really in 1920 when Ford built the River Rouge plant using the assembly line and electricity. So the electrification of industry was a major shift for improving our efficiency again, and there's a lot of literature on that topic. Our improvements slowed again in the 1960s and then dropped faster after 1970, again from the oil crises. About one quarter of this improvement is due to structural changes. Our economy is shifting from heavy industry to more services. It's about one quarter of the improvement uh, in recent decades. The rest is improved efficiency. This isn't just a US trend. This is a uh, recent finding from the Energy Information Administration looking at global patterns. So it's around the world uh, this is happening. More of what we want for um, a given amount of energy use. So again, what changed in the 70s? I was very little then. Some of you might have remember a little better. But as I understand as I've studied supply constraints and pollution. So we didn't actually run out of fuel, but there were bottlenecks in terms of how quickly we could increase production. We sought substitutes, because curves showing peak anything are really about substitution. And the most successful of these substitutes for oil was not synfuels or ethanol, but efficiency. The CAFE standards roughly doubled fuel economy over the period 1975 to 1985. Because we use oil for electricity generation, as I said, we also look to reduce electricity consumption through appliance standards. And so electricity growth slowed as well. And that, as I said, led to the cancellation of the nuclear plants. Pollution, we had soot, smog. We realized the dangers of leaded gasoline. We had Silent Spring, the Cuyahoga River catching on fire. All of these and many more led to the Clean Air Act extension of 1970 and the establishment of the EPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Essentially we realized pollution is a problem, let's do something about it. So realizing that energy wasn't unlimited and that pollution mattered. Those two really important factors of the early 1970s began our current transition. So we have efficiency standards and we have pollution standards. How do they go together? You could say we're going to use less energy, and the energy we use will be cleaner. And that is accurate. But here's another perspective. Energy efficiency saves you money. And pollution control equipment costs money, but has indirect benefits in, in health. This equipment could be scrubbers for coal plants, catalytic converters for cars, and so on. It obviously costs money to make those things. When you couple the two, you enable people to use slightly more expensive energy because you've spent the money on pollution controls for it, but still come out ahead because they need to use less energy. Maybe you're buying green power and it costs you know, an extra cent or two per kilowatt hour, but if you're reducing the amount of kilowatt hours you need, you still come out ahead, right? So we direct some of these economic gains from energy efficiency towards investment in cleaning up our energy supply. If you install solar on your house, the normal advice is to do all the efficiency you can first, and then solar to meet the rest, right? So that's the advice all of you got. It reduces the amount of solar you need to meet your electricity needs. The Moscone Center, the Moscone Center in San Francisco, put solar panels on in 2004, back when solar still cost quite a bit more than it does today. And these were paid for by the savings from an energy efficiency retrofit. So they explicitly coupled these two things together. When you use LED lights in an off-grid environment, it's the fact that LEDs are so efficient, the less you use the clean but fairly high cost combination of solar and batteries. On a kilowatt hour, by base, kilowatt hour basis, that's relatively expensive, but you don't need that much to run an LED. When states enacted renewable portfolio standards alongside efficiency standards, they were doing this more subtly. 
Renewables at the time cost slightly more than dirty electricity because we were ignoring externalities like pollution. But by increasing efficiency, they could make sure people's overall monthly bills didn't increase. So these two concepts go together in a very important way. A few more thoughts. Uh, efficiency is a tool. It's a means to an end. It's not the only metric that we think about uh, because it's not, the, it's not the actual end goal. Heating and cooling and transportation are not bad things to be avoided, especially if we can get them with minimal impacts. Our true goal is reducing the costs and the pollution associated with certain kinds of energy. All energy is not created equal. Now, in the 70s, using less energy was the way to reduce pollution because there weren't a lot of clean energy options. And now there are. So in some cases, we might rethink things. We're looking at a future of abundant, but not fully controllable clean energy. So you might choose a trade-off. Here's an example. A tankless water heater is much more energy efficient than an electric one with a storage tank. But that second one with storage tank can help the grid handle intermittent wind power. So if you're in New Brunswick or North Dakota, you might not want the efficient option. You might want the one that builds in storage and lets the grid accommodate variable wind. So there are times when there are, are trade-offs you might think about. Uh, second, efficiency saves you money. And I didn't bring a whole ton of facts here, um, but this book is a great one to look at. I worked uh, for a few years with Joe Rome, who writes for Climate Progress. Uh, here's one of his books from 1999. In it, he talks about a recurring competition at a Dow chemical facility, where year after year, the employees kept finding more low-hanging fruit, more improvements in efficiency that offered return on investment of over 100%. After a few years, we thought they must have found everything. Nope, they kept finding more and more efficiency improvements. This is a company of 2,000 engineers and scientists who didn't exhaust all their options in the first few years. They kept finding more of them. There's now an entire industry that implements energy efficiency improvements in commercial buildings and gets paid from the savings. Uh, that's a $6 billion business in the US. But it's important to think about the non-energy costs and benefits. The energy savings alone are worth six billion just to these companies to make a business out of it. But when we shifted, there's co-benefits too. When we shifted from coal to gas for residential heating, we reduced pollution and we freed up a lot of people's time. Coal furnaces required perhaps an hour a day of stoking and cleaning in some cases. So between the time savings and the pollution, savings were a lot of co-benefits besides simple direct energy cost. Similarly, green buildings can offer co-benefits, not just on you know, the energy side, energy savings are nice, but even a 1% improvement in your employees' uh, health or productivity or absenteeism, small improvements in the, the labor are worth way more because that's where all the cost is for a commercial building. If you have a green school, you might get some energy savings, and that's worth a little bit of money. But if you have daylighting, you might get much better test scores. And that's really what, you're, what you care about. So efficiency is great for cost savings, but it's also often very profound associated benefits uh, in these cases. Despite all of these benefits, energy efficiency improvements aren't always adopted, even when they make economic sense. <coughs> There are a lot of barriers, such as a lack of confidence about how these new systems will perform compared to your old but familiar system. The Energy Information Administration, among its other tasks, tries to forecast energy demand in the US. They estimate how many buildings will adopt different kinds of efficiency technologies based on their payback period. Federal buildings are supposed to do all the latent improvements that have a payback better than the federal bond rate. What's the federal bond rate? It's not very much. So if you have even a small payback from lighting, federal buildings are supposed to do that. That's about 2.5% of our commercial floor space. But about 26% of buildings will never do efficiency if it isn't the cheapest first cost option. 
They will only do the absolute cheapest first cost, about a quarter of our floor space. Why is that? Well, the major reason is the landlord-tenant disconnect. If the landlord owns the building and is responsible for all the capital improvements, but the tenant pays utility bills, who's going to do the efficiency improvement? There's no incentive there. So some work has been done to make better arrangements that let them share the benefits so that the landlords will make those investments and the tenants will manage the system properly to get its benefits. Um, but little has, some of that hasn't been done so far, but it's still a, a work in progress. So for this and other reasons, EIA often underestimated the potential for efficiency, in, especially in commercial buildings. And here, this chart shows you a group of architects kept trying to persuade the EIA otherwise. And these are projections of energy consumption. The projections in their 2005 report said, oh, energy consumption is going to go up like this. But it didn't. So in their 2007, oh, it'll go up like this. But it didn't. So 2009, well, it'll go up like this. But it didn't. So finally, these architects convinced the EIA, you know what? It's not going to be any higher in 2030 than it was in 2005. It's basically flat over that period. And the EIA is like, okay, fine. And the architect said, but if we use our best technology, we can actually have these reductions. And that shows the equivalent number of power plants that that corresponds to. So, efficiency uh, allows us to reduce pollution. By itself, it might or might not do that, but we can couple it, uh, re saving money, redirecting some of those gains towards cleaning up the energy supply. But let's just use energy that is nominally more expensive because we ignore the effects of pollution, but still come out ahead because we're using less energy. You might have heard about the rebound effect. What is that? What does that mean? It's not a problem. It's just not something to worry about. And I'll explain why that is. It's actually a good thing. Uh, all right. This is uh, Jevons. He's the main guy for rebound effect studies. So we'll get to him in a second. If the cost of something goes down, people tend to use more of it. They tend to. If your car's fuel economy doubles, your cost of driving goes down by about 10%. Other expenses you know, stay the same. The average driver might then tend to drive a little bit more. But unless their driving doubled, which it, it wouldn't, that wouldn't wipe out the efficiency gains. That's what we call the direct rebound, and it's fairly small. But the money freed up that goes in that customer's pocket, because they're not paying as much for gas, they have more disposable income, maybe they go out to eat a bit more often. Maybe they go to the movies more, do something, buy some more things for the house. That alternative spending involves some amount of energy, as well as labor and materials. But that's not a problem. This effect, the indirect rebound, is responsible for a large portion, and perhaps a majority, of all economic growth since the Industrial Revolution. It's the greatest argument for energy efficiency. We can expand our economy not by conquering new lands and exploiting new resources, as nations did for so much of their history, but by using innovation to get more goods and services out of a given amount of raw materials, what's not to like? As the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy said in a paper on the rebound effect, the gains are not lost due to the rebound effect, but they're used to meet other needs and desires. It's not a bad thing. And a portion of these gains can be spent on cleaning up energy supply. So it's just not a problem once you understand that Using less energy per se is not the goal. Reducing pollution and adverse impacts, that's the goal. Getting more of what we want with less of what we don't. So this is Jevons, William Stanley Jevons, an economist in mid-1800s uh, in England. He was concerned about the United Kingdom running out of coal. As steam engines became more efficient, they were used in more applications. And so the rate of coal consumption actually increased. So he could see that efficiency was not going to stop the UK from running out of coal. What he missed was that the UK, with the wealth generated by the indirect rebound effect, was able to develop new sources of energy, cleaner ones. And had he known that, he wouldn't have been happy. 
This is a great quote. He thought the economy was a zero-sum game. Among the residual possibilities of unforeseen events, it is just possible that someday the sunbeams may be collected, or that some, unknown, some source of force now unknown may be detected. But such a discovery would simply destroy our peculiar industrial supremacy. He thought the economy was a zero-sum game. As long as coal was the dominant fuel, the UK had an advantage. But if non-coal alternatives were developed, the UK might lose its position as the industrial superpower. Well, now the sunbeams are collected, and forces unknown to Jevons are used for power. The coal was largely depleted, and the UK is no longer the world's primary industrial superpower. But because the real world is not a zero-sum game, the UK is far more prosperous today. Longer lifetimes, better health, more amenities, and the nation no longer has 15 to 20 percent of its GDP destroyed by coal-related sickness and death, as it did in the late 1800s. And I had sources for that in my dissertation and some published papers. Um, so yeah, this was a real problem, a solution, and it wasn't really accounted for. Depletion and scarcity aren't going to be the main drivers for our uh, future changes in our energy supply. We'll keep on seeing some boom-bust cycles in oil, probably, um, but there's a lot of alternatives. We're moving off of fossil fuels primarily because of externalities, like the sickness and death from coal in industrial age England. What are externalities? They are impacts on somebody else. I just use the Wikipedia one, it's pretty you know, easy to understand. You do something that benefits you, but it hurts, well, it could help other people. My economics professor liked the, uh, the bakery example. A bakery has a positive externality to everybody walking by, because it smells so good. Um, but pollution is a negative impact on people nearby, or further away, depending. These are a market failure. Um, even if somebody claims to be a free market advocate, and many of the opponents of efficiency and renewables claim that, by economic theory, it is entirely appropriate to address this market failure through policy. The markets do not make the polluters pay, so policy can do it. That's perfectly sensible by policy if you, can, if you claim to be an advocate of the free markets. An idea of, uh, sorry, if you decide to not put a price on a negative externality, then you are subsidizing the source of that negative impact. In the ideal market, they would pay for the damages caused. If they don't have to, it's a subsidy to them. How much does that benefit? Well, there's a wide range, depending on the methodology and assumptions. The costs for coal are quite large, even at the lower end. So the low end is you know, 3.6 cents, the high end is 17.8. Um, the costs for gas are lower, but these studies are both from 2011, which really predate the shale gas boom, so they don't consider the methane leakage or groundwater contamination to the extent that a study done today might consider those. So the gas numbers um, could be adjusted. Um, as a sort of second best option, we level the playing field by giving a tax credit to wind power. That's better than doing nothing. And the PTC is at least in the right ballpark in the cost per kilowatt hour. What we give to wind or solar should not be thought of as props for a developing sector, but as a legitimate attempt to balance out the subsidy that the polluters get. So these two studies are pretty far ends of the spectrum. There's a lot of others in between. There is uncertainty, but one of my favorite quotes on the topic if you were unsure of the, of the precise value and you decide to ignore that altogether, that means you've decided the value is zero and nobody thinks that is the case. Externalities are real. Asthma attacks exacerbated by smog. Acid rain damaging lakes and buildings. Climate change driving, driving sea level rise and storm surge. Black lung affecting coal miners, especially if we pick up the tab, which looks like it will happen in some of these cases. Well water contamination, toxic coal sludge spills, oil spills, and many other impacts. They are a market failure, and it is both just and necessary to address them. From a point of view of basic morality, 
and from the point of view of economic theory. The major externality that we're concerned with is climate change. And the, the value of a scientific theory is established by its ability to make testable predictions. Here's another 19th century dude, Svante Arrhenius, Swedish chemist. He worked out global warming with pencil and paper in 1896. By 1908, he had arrived at a figure of four degrees of warming Celsius for each doubling of CO2. And that's within the range of current estimates. So he had a testable prediction. If we increase the CO2, then we will see warming. And that's what happened. And it was greater at the poles. He actually predicted polar amplification of warming. And that's been borne out by reality. It is not the case that scientists saw warming and decided to go blame CO2 retroactively. Rather, they first saw the CO2 increase and predicted it would warm the planet, which it has. So it's a testable prediction that was confirmed by reality. This is just the known economically viable fossil fuel reserves. That would cause warming of about four to five degrees Celsius. Um, so we have to leave most of the fossil fuel reserves in the ground. Of course, there could be future discoveries that would make that even, even higher. So we get these questions. Are we doomed? Is it too late? Absolutely not. And I, let me illustrate this point by noting the fighting retreat of the deniers. Used to see comments from people denying global warming, GW. Then when the warming trend became too hard to deny, it became AGW, anthropogenic, accepting the warming but denying that it was human caused. Nowadays, I see comments denying catastrophic anthropogenic global warming. That's clever. Catastrophic is a subjective term. If a denier doesn't feel that the loss of a particular ecosystem or coastal city qualifies as a catastrophe, there's no way to factually dispute their opinion. It's just, that's not a catastrophe to me, losing Miami or whatever. That's just, you know, that just happens. So as you add on catastrophic, you realize it's a matter of uh, a degree and, and opinion. But it is useful for us to keep in mind that likewise, trying to stop or slow global warming, that there is no firm threshold that is catastrophic. There are bad impacts at two degrees that we don't have at 1.5. But if we miss that trajectory, and there are bad impacts at 2.5 degrees that we don't have at two, and so on. So no matter what trajectory we are on, there is never a time to give up in despair. Uh, okay, let's go through, let's get through this one. Oh, I'll do it. All right. I think I have time. Uh, addressing the challenge of climate change means that some known fossil fuel reserves will have to be left in the ground, about 80% actually. This requires abandoning a resource that is convenient and valuable and reliable uh, in economic terms. Vaclav Smil is probably the foremost scholar on these transitions, and anybody studying in this field has to acknowledge his perspective and respond to it. He makes these points to underscore how hard it will be to shift away from fossil fuels and how long it will take. I think he overstates that difficulty, bangs the drum a little too hard, and discourages people, and he ignores how far we've come. He knows that we had a society built around renewable fuels and shifted to one based on fossils for a few reasons. Wood scarcity was a local issue. I didn't see that in railroad wood prices uh, in the 1800s in my studies. Quality is subjective again. Density matters for air travel, but for other factors, I'm not sure they are inherently superior. The lower cost was the major factor. Um, as I mentioned, the railroads routing through the coal fields. But that doesn't account for externalities. So then he tries to make the point that going from um, fossil fuels back to renewables will face a challenge because of these issues. The fossil fuels are adequate for generations to come, the new energies are not superior, and they will not be substantially cheaper. Well, if you're gonna talk about abundance, there might be enough fossil fuels to meet the needs of the, of the developing world for the next century, but if abundance is your concern, the potential of renewables, especially solar, is many orders of magnitude greater. So, as I said, I don't think scarcity and abundance would be the main drivers, though I do expect to see some um, fluctuations. 
What about quality? They're not going to be qualitatively superior? Well, solar power is clean, quiet, safe, and portable. Each of those attributes is valuable. It works for off-grid, distributed, and central power generation. Who here has a solar charger for their cell phone? Anyone bring a solar charger? Anyone bring like a portable generator to charge your cell phone? Um, so, and we do value these attributes that solar has. And they won't be cheaper, really. The two things I think he neglected here, and this, this is a 2006 claim of his, and the learning curves and externalities. This is probably the most important graph of the past two decades. It's the learning curve for solar power. For every doubling of cumulative production, prices fall by about 20%. There are ups and downs due to supply bottlenecks. There was a silicon shortage temporarily. But that's the overall trend, is that the decline. These improvements don't just happen because time passes. They don't just happen because we put deployment on hold, ignore what we have, and go do R&D in a lab, hunting for a breakthrough in some brand new miracle technology. They happen because of deployment, incremental improvements, and intense competition, which does mean the occasional bankruptcy. They happen because early adopters invest in technology even when it is not yet proven or not yet cost effective. These cost reductions lead to much broader deployment and are the direct result of the investments made by many of you here. So thank you. You put up solar in the 70s or 80s or early 90s, you know, that's your credit. If, uh, as a matter of policy, countries say, we'll wait for solar to become cheaper, then they're saying they want to be a free rider on the efforts of others. I actually saw a report recommending that Australia do this. Thankfully, it seems to be ignored. So a few thoughts to wrap up. Uh, we are in an energy transition, driven by concerns about supply and concerns about pollution. The research into alternative energy started in the 70s has now paid off with dramatic cost reductions in solar and wind and tremendous advances in energy efficiency. Could we have gotten here earlier, if not for certain interruptions in this progress in the 80s? Uh, maybe, but we are here now. Um, electrification was the key to a couple of prior transitions. It led to revolution in lighting, with electric lighting being much safer and far more efficient than gas lights. It led to factories improving their efficiency after a couple of decades of worsening performance. And we have the ability to make electricity from a lot of different sources, many of which are carbon-free or, or very low carbon. So can EVs provide the means, electric vehicles provide the means for electricity to once again improve efficiency and reduce pollution? I will talk about this in my workshop uh, tomorrow at noon. And finally, uh, my main point is that efficiency gives you an economic windfall. You can spend some of this cleaning up the energy supply and still come out ahead. Thank you.